Good afternoon and welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon session at All About Women, Sober Curious. Before we begin, oh, my name's Clementine Ford. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I'd also like to use this opportunity as well to tell you about an initiative, if you are not yet familiar with it, called Pay the Rent, which it was begun by Lydia Thorpe in Melbourne uh, or in Nam. And Pay the Rent is an initiative that essentially asks those of us who are colonisers and settlers on this stolen land to financially give back and pay restitution in the ways that we can. So Pay the Rent, one of the things that it funds is the funeral fund. So uh, you may be familiar with um, the risk of deaths in custody that Aboriginal people still face in this country. But you may not be familiar with the fact that very often funerals cannot be paid for because of ongoing oppression and lack of financial resources. So one of the things that Pay the Rent does is, is uh, direct funds to the funeral fund and um, allow people to bury their family members with dignity. So please check out Pay the Rent. Uh, you can look up Lydia Thorpe as well and just give whatever you can, $5, $10, and consider it an ongoing donation. Um, thank you for coming to this session. I will begin by introducing our very sober panellists. <laughs> oh, and also, sorry, Jill, I almost forgot. <laughs> Jill has asked me to mention that uh, Jill's written about mental health and she's a mental health advocate and she, like me, suffers from anxiety and Jill's asked me to mention that she's feeling very anxious on stage today and it's really good to put that out there <laughs> so everyone knows that, you know, it's not this hidden secret and this, this will make her feel better to have you know that she's experiencing some anxiety. I'm also experiencing some anxiety. Is anyone else experiencing anxiety in this room? Today. All right, we can all sit there and just acknowledge that our anxiety is real, but we don't need to be afraid of it because we all know that it's there and we can hold each other through it. So Thanks, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing so generously, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Jill Stark is an award-winning journalist and author with a career spanning two decades in both the UK and Australian media. She spent 10 years on staff at The Age, covering health and social affairs as a senior writer and columnist, and now works as a freelance journalist, media consultant and speech writer. Her first book, High Sobriety, was longlisted for the Walkley Book Award and shortlisted in the Kibble Literary Awards. And her mo most recent book, When You're Not Okay, is on sale, along with High Sobriety, at the and bookshop. And Happily Never After, the one in between. And Happily Never After, <laughs> yes. Um, but the, one, the When You're Not Okay one specifically deals with Yes, well, they both deal anxiety with anxiety, as well. but the, the last one is kind of a toolkit for those moments when you're not quite sure how to yep. survive. Yeah. And I have a copy of it, and it's very helpful. <laughs> so please welcome Jill. Thank you. Shanna Wan is a rural, rural woman and the CEO and founder of national alcohol awareness charity Sober in the Country. And she's hit national media in the last two years after her relentless advocacy for remote peers has been heard far and wide. Since her episode on Australian Story aired in November, her authentic and raw brand of conversations has gone viral around the country. Please welcome Shanna Wan. Thank you. Nice to be here. And last but not least, a woman who certainly needs no introduction here or anywhere else in Australia, who is rocking the best hair I've ever seen Eva. today. <laughs> <coughs> Yumi Steins is a writer, broadcaster, television presenter, food fanatic, fitness enthusiast, and mother of four, and razzer of Carrie Ann Kennelly, which I like. <laughs> Yumi's latest book is called Welcome to Your Period. Among her daily responsibilities, she presents a national radio show on the KISS network called The 3PM Pickup. She also hosts an ABC podcast about women's health called Ladies We Need to Talk. And the podcast focuses on female sexuality and social issues and is known for its directness and taboo-breaking conversations. Please welcome Yumi Stein. And her hair. <laughs> so if people feel comfortable, I, I should preface this by saying this obviously is, is a panel about, you know, our three guests are, have all written about sobriety. They are all practising sobers. <laughs> is that what you would say? Um, but I am not a sober person and I'm but potentially well known by people for being a <laughs> bit of a lush. Um, so you may be wondering why someone like me is hosting a panel like this. And that's because I think that there's a lot of fertile ground to meet in the middle and discuss some of uh, the same correlating issues. But I just wanted to ask people if you feel comfortable and certainly don't feel compelled if you don't, just to have a show of hands of people who do drink. 
and people who are sober. This is an intervention. Just <laughs> <laughs> We've brought you here today to get you off the grog. <laughs> It's our cunning plan. Um, no, interesting, because, of course, <clears throat> Australia has, a, like, a deeply entrenched connection to alcohol and what it supposedly means for our national identity. Um, and we're going to get into some of those issues very shortly, but I wanted to begin by asking you all to each briefly talk about some of the work that you've done in this area and also what brought you to it personally. So if we could begin with you, Jill. Thanks, Clem, and thanks for mentioning my anxiety. It always takes a bit of the sting out of it, just to say it out loud. And also, these shoes were giving me anxiety, because I thought if I <laughs> fall on my face on the stage, that will be the worst <laughs> thing that could happen. But I didn't, so it wasn't. Um, so yeah, my journey to sobriety, I guess, started in 2011. I woke up on New Year's Day with the worst hangover I've ever had in my life. I thought I was going to die. Um, had a violent panic attack when I was driving the car to Macca's. And, um, <laughs> it's always Macca's. Yeah, uh, and thought to myself then, something really needs to change. I was about to turn 35, I'd been binge drinking pretty much every weekend since I was 13 growing up in Scotland, mm -hmm. where um, teetotalism is a crime punishable by death. Um, and I realised that, um, you know, something had to change. I, I was, it was becoming problematic. So I decided to stop for three months, which I did. I wrote a blog about it through a group called Hello Sunday Morning. I then wrote a piece, I was a um, staff reporter for The Age, which is kind of ironic because I was a health reporter and I was out there winning awards for writing about Australia's alcohol time bomb. That was the name of my series. And so, you know, during the week I was writing about that and at the weekends I was writing myself off. And so I, I um, which was the way we promoted the book. And. Um, so I decided to out myself in the paper as this sort of binge drinking health reporter and it was the biggest response of any piece I've ever written. People from all over the country were saying, oh, it's like it was reading my own story. Um, so <coughs> I was then offered a book deal off the back of that and they said, if you do this for 12 months, there's a book in that. And I was like, great, come out of the publisher's office, wanted to go and get drunk to celebrate, realised I couldn't for nine months, mm -hmm. so I was locked into that contract. Did that for a year, wrote High Sobriety, which came out in 2013, and that was very much... Um, um, uh, an, a forensic examination of my own drinking habits and why I drink, but also looking at the wider Australian culture and Scotland where I grew up and why we use alcohol to celebrate, commiserate, commemorate and everything in between. And what I found was really illuminating and really rewarding. And it was, you know, absolutely a dream come true to write a book and for it to become, much to my great surprise, a bestseller. And so I had everything I'd ever wanted, dream job, book deal, um, had my own home, I was dating an AFL player, don't do that, that was not a good idea. <laughs> but you know, on, on paper I had it all, you know, and then slowly things started to unravel, I went back to drinking and that wasn't the reason um, that I had what my well, I had a breakdown in 2014-15, which my psychologist rebranded as a breakthrough. Definitely go for that. Um, that's your next book. That's my, well, it was my next book. So Happy Never <laughs> After was the book that basically <laughs> described that breakdown and what I learned through the, the toughest periods of my life. So I've had a really tough journey with mental health in the last sort of five years, but I've rebuilt myself. And along the way, I went back to drinking and everything was kind of fine. I was moderately drinking for a while. And then old habits began to creep back in. I was um, starting to, to really, I don't know if anyone experiences anxiety, you know, that feeling, the hangover anxiety, where you feel like you're wrapped in a blanket of shame and regret, and every mistake you've ever made is playing like a technicolor, like horror show in your head, and your sort of world is teetering on the brink of the apocalypse. Yeah. I was having that even just after mm. a few drinks. Um, I was Because mm. the older you get, the fun thing is your alcohol doesn't really break down in your body very well. So I realized that I could no longer ignore the correlation between the dip in my mood and um, my sort of weekend binge drinking. So nine months ago, so I'm almost due the baby, um, nine months ago I stopped drinking. <laughs> um, and this time, unlike the first time, which was kind of an experiment because I was being paid to do it really, this time it is for my mental health. And I have to say that on, other than a shitload of therapy, this has this, been the single most helpful thing I've done for my mm, mental health in amazing. recent years is to stop drinking. And I'm not saying everyone should do that, but for me personally, that has been so helpful. Um, and I've started to realize that all of the ways that I was using alcohol were kind of to hide to mask a lot of feelings. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to feel vulnerable. And also, I was using alcohol to belong, and the alcohol mm -hmm. industry has played a very 
big role in telling us that we need a drink on our hand to belong mm. and to feel part of yeah. something. So I, that's, that's where um, I've gone with this journey. And as for me, yeah, absolutely, it's a mental health uh, decision at this point. I don't know if I'll go back to drinking. I can't see it at this point. For me, the things that I value most in my life, my mental health, my friendships, my relationships, my career, my, um, my happiness, my vitality, my fitness are all strengthened by not drinking and this sort of short-term hedonistic high that I get from drinking is not mm. enough for me to give that up. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing as well, I just want to use that as an opportunity to highlight that so often the mental distress that people are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis is so easily masked. No one could have watched you deliver what you just did <laughs> and think that you were sitting there in a state of high anxiety. Oh, no, just, just very briefly, I would say as well that I, not being sober doesn't get rid of my anxiety. Absolutely not. I'm still, I still struggle. I'm human. But my ability to cope with mm. these episodes is so much greater than it would mm. be have I, if when I was drinking. Like, I, the crashes, like, my mood was like, like a roller coaster, whereas now I'm a lot more kind of stable. Mm. So mm. that's what I find. Thank you. Shanna, you started an initiative called Sober in the Country, and you come from a very particular perspective, being from rural Australia, where yeah. alcohol use is, in fact, one of the... Um, also punishable by death. Yeah, also punishable by Sorry, death. Sorry, not having it. It's um, punishable by death. Uh, <laughs> Adults residing, I'm just reading some of my stats off here, adults residing in outer regional and remote Australia were more likely to exceed the lifetime risk guideline with close to one in four or 23.5% exceeding alcohol use compared with close to one in five adults living in inner regional Australia. So this is something that was, you were living this world. Mm. Can you tell people about sober For in the sure. country? sure. And also, are there any other people from the bush here today? Yes, oh my gosh, hey. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I, I, dare I ask, are you guys here to yeah, me, me? Did you come to listen to me? <laughs> That's wild. I just love it, because it's a real pain to get here. Let me give you the tip. It's a long... I, will, I will say as well, my aunt's from the bush, and she, when she yeah, said that I was doing this panel, she said, oh my God, you're going to be on a panel <laughs> with Shanna Wan. Annabelle, Auntie Annabelle. Auntie Isn't it Anna. great? And um, Clem has some bush roots as well. So, but um, thank you very, very much, firstly, for having me. It's, a, it's always an honour. I, oh man, I, I thought about this a fair bit. I don't plan terribly. I, I just speak according to the vibe on the day, I suppose. And um, I thought that today, because I'm the, I'm the person on the panel who nearly died from alcoholism, I wasn't sober curious. I was a bit more get sober or you'll die. So I think because these girls will do such a magnificent job of covering the lighter, you know, less... <laughs> nearly dead bit. I'll represent those of us who might need, you know. So yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing I advocate broadly. I do broad scale advocacy from the softer end of the spectrum to the harder end. But yeah, I, uh, five years ago, woke up at the bottom of a flight of stairs with a massive hole between my eyes. And um, sorry, I didn't wake up on the floor by the stairs. I woke up in emergency. My husband had found me. Um, did anyone here watch Australian Story? Yeah, so that explains it really nicely. If you haven't watched it, guys, honestly, not because it's obviously my beautiful face you've got to stare at for 28 minutes. It's a very powerful documentary on, on our, you know, our story, which is not just our story. It's lots and lots and lots of people's stories. Um, one of the first things I'm at pains to say is that there's nothing unique or special about me at all. My story is not uncommon. Alcoholism is not uncommon. Alcohol abuse, addiction, misuse, whatever you want to call it, is rampant in the country. Something I hear all the time when I speak publicly is, oh, it's not just in the bush, it's everywhere. And I say, I know that, but this is my lane. And I speak to this lane because we've got incredible humans who are already doing this for us in the big smoke. There's not a soul that I'm aware of in the country who's a recovered alcoholic, who wants to talk about it, is willing or prepared to, and has somehow managed to build a national profile out of it. But back in the day, five years ago, I was just busy focusing on learning how to survive. Honestly, I, it was like learning to walk, coming from alcoholism into a new life in the bush. Whoa, it's, it's pretty wild because um, country Australia is amazing. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But we do have a mad, passionate obsession around grog. And one of the reasons for that is we're socially, geographically isolated, right? You might go for big stints at a time without seeing people. So when you get together, the central focal point is often alcohol, whether it's football, picnic races, whatever. 
grog, grog, and more grog. And that's really no problemo because connection is important. So if you don't have a drinking problem, it's great. But if you do, it's shit. It's really hard. You don't fit. You don't belong anywhere, as I discovered, learning to be sober in the country. Um, we're not equipped out there to cope with this conversation. It's, it's, it's crazy, actually. So newly recovering at that time, and I identify as recovered because I, I don't think about want or need alcohol. I wouldn't do this if I did. I would never pick up a drink again because that would be like playing Russian roulette and expecting to get out of it alive. But I don't want grog, so that's just an important clarification for me. And I don't judge or demonise those who can drink. Big, important part of my advocacy. I don't give a stuff who does what. We're here for people who can't, so that they feel included in the chat as well. Just always have to clarify that bit. But um, as I was coming through my own journey, I looked around and I thought, hmm, this is a bit messed up. I tried to run an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in the bush because everyone said to me, the best thing you can do to help others is to give back. And I was like, okay, sweet. What, what does that mean? They said, oh, I'll run a meeting. And I went, okay, I'll do that. Tried, guess what? You're not anonymous in the bush. Everyone knows that that's Jill Stark's car at 8.30 outside the building where the AA meeting is <laughs> on a Tuesday night. So I sat there like a loser for two years, baking scones, waiting for humans to come praying for humans to come, because I know about two thirds of my country town should have been in that room. But I was just Nigel No Friends. And eventually I cracked it, threw the towel in and went home and went, right, hmm, okay, what can I do now? And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll study health and I'll work one-on-one -on -one with people. I'll help one-on-one. -on -one. Studied, graduated as a holistic health coach, worked with two people and went, this is not me. Damn, back to the drawing board. I'm now three and a half years into my sobriety. So loads of failures, loads of failures. Frustration, tears, angst, um, whatever. And I remember sitting there one day and we were watching Australian Story by Chance and Talitha Cummins' episode came on. Did any of you guys see that? She spoke publicly about her alcoholism and I went, Tim, she's speaking about it. Oh. And it was just like an enlightening moment. I was like, that's good. That's, that's a good thing. She's, she's a lovely, beautiful, normal mm. human. Anyway, that was the kernel of the birth of the idea about using my journalism, rural Australia-wide network, which if you've lived in the bush for five minutes, you know one person, you know all people. Mm. It doesn't take long to build a profile if you've got half a bit of go about you. Really, it doesn't. Rural Australia is tiny. And um, I just thought, okay, so you're a journalist, photographer, really clever with marketing and media and bits and pieces, you can't talk. Um, you can't have kids, so you're going to be doing what for the next 20, 30 years? And I went, bugger it, I'm going to have a go at this. Mm. And I set about speaking, I blew my own anonymity sky high, and I realised, you know what, we can do better than this in the bush. If we can look after our mates when they get cancer, or when there's a crisis, or when there's a fire, or a whatever, we can look after them when they get alcoholism because yeah. we've been shouting them beers for 20 years and watching them get it. So this is crap and I want to speak about that. And I got a little disruptive, but I literally, all I do is I'm very colloquial, very down to earth, very real. I just speak truth because the way I see it is nothing survives or thrives in darkness. Bring something out, bring it into the light. It's like you, Jill, when you said, I just need to say I'm anxious. Well, I just needed to say I'm an alcoholic. Big, fat, hairy deal. I'm still mm. me. So let's talk about it. So that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yumi, you come from a background that's quite strongly associated with alcohol in a different way, perhaps, mm. to, you know, newspaper journalism or the bush, the music world. Yep. What brought you to sobriety and how, like, what was the, the moment where you realised that something needed to change in your life? Well, I, I knew it for a long time and my dad was an alcoholic and I, I mirrored his drinking for a long time and it wasn't until I first got pregnant and stopped drinking that I realised how intensely I drank. Mm. And having four kids, what I discovered was after each pregnancy, I'd have a raging need to drink. Like, the baby came out mm. and I was like, put a beer in my hand immediately because that was fucked. <laughs> 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 and I sort of, I would compensate for all the months I hadn't dr drunk <coughs> after, after the babies were born. Um, the, the thing about coming from the music industry is you will not find a more supportive group of people 
mm. who understand your need for sobriety. They have been through it all and they are so respectful they will never thrust a drink on you. They might offer you a line. <laughs> <laughs> but they will say, okay, I get it, you're sober, you know? So that's a great place to actually come from because they, they've seen people go to hell and mm. spend time in hell. Yeah. Um, for myself, I knew, so I'd, I'd quit drinking a couple of times and each time it was like um, discovering my superpowers because I'd be like, wow, my guts feel good and I feel sexy and I can think straight and I can work after 5 p.m. Like there's all these things I can do, um, but the drink would pull me back in. And mm. um, eventually I sort of set a mile, I, was, I set a, a, a line and was like, right, I'm gonna quit drinking for life because this is really good for me. But until I get to that point, I'm gonna have a really big bender just to get it all out <laughs> of my system. And, um, and I had a bender and, and then I kept moving the finish line. Mm. And it, it was really bad. It was actually really fucking scary because I knew that I had to stop drinking and I knew I was experiencing addiction and withdrawal and cravings. Mm. And I felt like a junkie loser, you know, like waking up going, right, today is the day I stopped drinking for the rest of my life. But by 1 p.m. I have found a bullshit way to justify drinking that night. And often you find as an alcoholic that you structure your social life around drinking friends or drinking occasions and enabling yourself. Mm. Uh, and I would do sneaky things. I've always been lucky in that the people I have loved deeply are not drinkers and are not enablers, but it also makes them blind to those behaviours. So I would ask my partner to buy me a six pack of beer knowing I had the identical six pack in the fridge already and he wouldn't notice. Mm that I'd actually drunk two six packs. Mm. Um, and he's so sweet that he wouldn't be counting the empties or anything like that. So as, it, as the, the uh, finish line for my drinking kept moving, I got more of a sense of how urgent this was getting. Mm. You know, vomiting sometimes in the morning, uh, th having jealousy about people like, why the fuck has she written a book? She's an idiot. <laughs> I could write a better book than that, but not being able to because I'm feeling like shit most days, you know, and I can't even, I can barely get to work, I can finish my work and then I have to just come home and be lousy, you know, so. Uh, how, how old were your two young, because there's a gap between your two youngest and your two eldest. Yeah. How old were your two youngest when this was happening? Like one, mm. one and two. Um, and that's a really, like, it's a thirsty time too for a mum because you're mm. stuck at home and mm. it's really, like, okay to drink when you're a mum. Well, I want to, I want you to continue, but later on I want to also talk about that <laughs> yeah. culture around, like, wine time for mums <laughs> and how that feeds into it. But Yeah, so just, just to get to how I ended up stopping was knowing full well that I did and pushing out that, that um, end point by about eight to ten months. I got to New Year and I thought this is as good as a time as, as any to stop. And so I let myself have all the alcohol that I wanted. And it was like a little <laughs> Yumi party. Um, and I kind of <clears> thought <throat> that, I'd, that I'd like kicked it in the dick. And then <laughs> four days later I was invited to a party and uh, they didn't have any light beer or non-alcoholic drinks. And so I just drank beer and I got really pissed. And I realised that this bitch cannot do moderation. Mm. I can't do one, I can't do a half, I can't do light beer. Because as soon as I have that first beer, it's like the switch is on and I, I have got a raging heart on to fuck all the beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, th so that's the lesson. And I think there are people in this room who need to hear that, that you're that person too. <laughs> I've never heard that. You can't do, Love it. You it's can't huge, do huge one drink. beer slots in this yeah. room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I reckon I could have outdone you. It's quietly. <laughs> we should talk about that. <laughs> it's quite um, it's quite stressful Fruity. listening to you describe that because I recognise not probably so much in terms of the alcohol, but and I know that I know that addiction to cigarettes is very different to addiction to alcohol. But that same pattern of being an all or nothing person or thinking about I guess what when you were describing that constantly pushing the finishing line back and back and back. Were you, there's, there's fear always in seeking to end something, but what did that fear feel like to truly open yourself up to the necessity that you needed to give up this thing that not only was 
for obviously providing such a huge crutch to you, but that you felt like, however accurately or not, you felt like you really loved. Yeah. It, it was definitely um, scary to feel it gathering me back, mm. da like on a daily basis, because I would wake up saying, today's the day I stop. Mm. And then by one o'clock I was weak and feeling jittery and feeling thirsty, you know? And mm. it was, I was so afraid that I would just toss my life and I could map a future Yumi who actually had sold everything, gathered her assets, lived in a caravan and spent her pension on beer mm. and didn't give a shit and just like mm. the kids would call and I'd be drunk and you know after 1pm they couldn't call me and that was what I had agreed in, to my soul. I'd, I had made that pact that that's how mm. I would see out my days. Mm. That was fucking scary, like that was mm. a I potential. Think I was just going to say that, uh, that like obviously Yumi and Shannon's story is like very profound and I think for a lot of people and this is what I found when I was trying to give up drinking, there's this, there's this concept of, well, I'm not like those guys, so mm. it's okay. And mm. I find that, for me, I wasn't, I didn't want to fuck all the beers in the, <laughs> in the day. I love that, though. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not very good at moderation, but I do think oh. that, um, that we live in a culture which makes it very difficult to stop drinking, even if you don't um, identify as an alcoholic, as I didn't. But when I woke up that day and I thought to myself, I'm going to stop for three months. The thought of stopping drinking scared the fucking shit out of me, and I knew then that I had to give it a go because, mm -hmm. and I think that's what I would say to anyone in the audience who's thinking about, who's sober curious, who's thinking, could I, could I stop? If, if the thought of stopping makes you think that your life will be over, then perhaps alcohol is playing a role that, that mm. is, is out of balance. And I think we do yeah. tend to think that we need it, particularly as women, as you're saying, Clem, that we're told by the industry, like the industry has, has marketed to women very, it's very deliberate, and I've looked at this in high sobriety, it's very deliberate for the last two decades, this kind of like equalization, almost overcorrection of mm. alcohol being a man's domain. And you actually used to have different parts of the pub where women weren't allowed to go into, it was only for men. And so the idea of the kind of Ladek culture that, that grew up where we were drinking whiskey and dining beers to try and be like the men, the alcohol industry have capitalized on that and they've created drinks. Like in America, there was two brands going to war, Mommy Juice and Mommy's Wine Time, like in court mm. for trademark Mommy Juice yeah, like sounds horrendous. revolting. Like, yeah, but this, <laughs> this idea that we need it to, it's, it's not surprising that we get into to difficulty with alcohol because we're, it's deliberately marketed to us in a way that tells us mm -hmm. we need it to belong, to survive motherhood, to survive being a woman, all those kind of things. So, and let's yeah. not forget well, and, it's and profit. And there's mm -hmm. a way as well, f um, I, I wanted to touch on what you said when you were talking earlier about alcohol being a pathway into belonging, mm. particularly in a country like Australia where it doesn't feel... I mean, other countries that I've travelled to, the alcohol presence is just not anywhere near to the extent that it is here. Whereas it feels like here, if you were to say, "Well, I'm not drinking," not only would people not really know. They tell you, what they to literally do with tell that. you that you're un-Australian. I was told that many, yeah. many times. Or you're not fun. You know, you're yeah. un-Australian, or you're yeah. not fun. And I, there's a suspicion, I think, from people who have to, who, people who are drinking. There's a suspicion in dealing with people who are either sober or who are not drinking even just that night. And it's almost like, well, you need to drink to make me feel better about the fact Always. that I'm drinking. Yep. Because I'm on some level sense that there's something maybe not quite right with, with this particular cultural way of being. It's when we drink, um, it's a social contract. You know, it's a contract between the two of you that you're gonna let your inhibitions down, you're gonna let your barriers down. And so when someone opts out of that, it's like the contract's been broken and you can't, you're kind mm -hmm. of on different planes. And so what I've found is that that sense of being vulnerable, of being, you know, you know that way when you get drunk, you're like, I love you, no, I really love you, like mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I made a promise to myself that I would do, well, all the things I used to do when I was drunk, but I would, I would say to the people that matter to me, the things that were in my heart, completely sober, and not mm -hmm. wait to be drunk. Because how many times have you woken up going, did they really mean that, or were they just like oversharing because they were shit faced? Like the uh, like that idea of of telling the people in your life that they matter when you're completely sober is so much more profound and deeply connected mm -hmm. when when you don't have a drink in your hand because you know it's real. Mm. Can I add to just talking about? The implication of if somebody chooses to go sober, I believe is the hashtag, um, you know, what, what the ramifications can be. And I'll bring it back to the bush. Um, a case study, probably my favourite case study that motivates me day and night, is a very dear friend of mine, came to m my husband and my place one day and 
broke down, literally just fell apart in front of our eyes. And his wife and kids had packed up and left because he was a high functioning alcoholic who could not stop. And he was headed down, as we all are if we don't stop. Anyway, yay for, yay for our mate, he's successfully recovered and sober today very actively involved in the local rugby, rugby club community. He just gives and he gives and he gives. Now, to this day, that bloke can go and be involved in as much community stuff as he likes, and he still, two and a half years down the track, has other men in his age group, which is our mid-40s, saying, what's wrong with you, mate? Have a beer, harden up. Can't trust a bloke who says no to a beer. Blah, 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 blah. And, it, like, literally, that, that brings out oh, I'm a warrior woman in me who fights. I actually fight for men as much as women now because they, don't, they can't talk like we can, honestly. Like well, they... do you think that one of the, one of the aspects that occurs to me could, that could be happening there as well... I mean, Jill, you were talking about when drinking lowers our inhibitions, it makes us more touchy-feely with people, it makes us, oh, I love yeah, you, I love me. you, mate. So the fact that, firstly, in broadly speaking in Australia, we have a hyper-masculine culture that makes it difficult for men to communicate and connect mm. with each other, mm. um, particularly because of, you know, culturally enforced homophobia. And that's magnified in rural settings. Is the alcohol, is one aspect of the alcohol use that it's it alcohol. allows men to connect with each other? A hundred percent, it's alcophobia. I actually, we're pretty cool with homophobic stuff. Oh, sorry, we, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> we can have that chat now, we're so advanced, it's great. But it's funny, that's an analogy I frequently use, is to say, guys, where we're at with booze is where we were 20 or 30 years ago with the homosexual discussion. We can do better and we've got to do better. So there's a couple of things at play. One is it's a, quite a new concept for some of our mates. Two, it's a social lubricant. And three, we simply do actually not know what to do with a man who's got enough confidence to say, no, thanks, not today, because it's just a bit of a new beast. Happily, it's changing. But it's, I think, I think because of the circumstances we have rurally and regionally, e.g., you know, we don't have the endless maybe cycle clubs or arts clubs or alternatives to social stuff. Mm. The pub is, it's the heart and soul of everything. It really is. And if you look at the ads from certain unmentionable uh, marketing companies that appeal to that manly, manly, manly demographic, crack that beer when you've... Had yeah, a hard, hard day, because you earned it, mate. Hard days How work, about you earn the hard, right to look after yourself because yeah. you're in 10 years of drought and you might need a bit of a break that mm. doesn't involve getting shit-faced at the end mm. of every day. So there's heaps and heaps and heaps of levels at play, but it's, um, it breaks my heart to see the resistance that I see on a daily basis mm. against people who are big enough and ugly enough to stand up and go, no, thank you. Mm. You know, so I think we're seeing change, but gosh, it's, it's, it's confronting because mm. it's that mirror effect. But it's also, I just don't think mm. anyone, I mean, I was a health reporter for 10 years. I've written two books about mental health and it was only in the second book after writing a book about not drinking for a year that I realised mm. that alcohol was really bad for my mental health. Like, for, yeah. and, and I just don't think we understand that. People go, oh, it's bad for your liver and stuff. But the way yeah. that alcohol actually affects your mood, is, it's, it's really quite But it also it temporarily makes you feel it better. Tem well, this mm. is the thing for me. Like, I have, in the last sort of two months, I've had, had a bit of a, a struggle with anxiety again. And it's been a while since I've felt that way. And I have been at dinner with friends sometimes just like I would rip off my own arm and throw it at that woman to have her glass of rosé, <laughs> you know, like mm. I just, because I feel like it would take the edge off. But what I know for me personally is that it takes the edge off, but the next morning those edges are sharper, they mm. cut me deeper and I just don't cope. So I think mm. like I'd love to see a bit more of understanding, like some education around, like for, particularly for men, like I've got so mm. many friends who are, are really, you know, hard-hitting investigative journos who, whose entire coping strategy is to go to the pub mm. and get hammered. Yeah. And then they don't understand why they're yelling at their editor and they're like falling apart in their relationships. Mm. Like, I'm not saying alcohol is the only thing, but it's really, as a coping method, it's, it's pretty, you know, if it was a kind of second-hand car salesman like today, tonight, would have run it out of town a long time ago. Like, it's just not, it's not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Yumi, I want to bring in some of the contradictions as well that exist uh, in Australia. And it, generally, you'd probably see this in most countries as well, but, um, you know, we mentioned the, like, the wine time for mummy earlier. 
and there is definitely a, a narrative around women, particularly mothers of small children, joking publicly about, you know, well, I need to have my wine to be able to make it through the day. But that's a, that's a narrative that really privileges certain groups of people. So uh, as a white middle class woman, I can lean fully into that kind of stereotype about, you know, knocking, oh, I'm a, I came out here and I said I'm a lush, you know, knocking it back and I'm drinking while breastfeeding my child. But a very different scenario if I'm an Aboriginal woman living in this country who is subject to, you know, vastly more intense discrimination and um, scrutiny over the choices that I make when it comes to alcohol. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about that given that you are the only non-white woman on the <laughs> panel, um, but also you mentioned as well, you joked about, or I don't know if you were joking, but you mentioned seeing a very clear pathway to you living in that caravan and becoming someone who suddenly would not be like an acceptable version of alcoholism, which is, which is, what, which is the privilege that's given to the middle class. Yeah, and that's not, a, that's not a joke. That's a real fantasy. That Sometimes I still have that fantasy that I could just quit everything, you know, quit life and just drink full time. Um, the thing that I experienced was not what an Indigenous woman would experience, I imagine. Um, it was probably the opposite. So being a model minority type of person, um, my drinking was really, really invisible. And I noticed with my partner, who is very attentive and loving, and my best friend, they both, when I said, look, I've got to quit drinking, I've got a problem, they both were like, I don't think that you do. Mm. And I really had to say, I need you to validate this because I'm not making it up. Like, why would I make, the, make up this story? You know, I love alcohol, but I love it too much. So because I was good at hiding it and because I fit into this, like, I'm neat and tidy and little and Asian and I'm not sort of slopping all over the shop, I'm not bringing strangers home to have sex with, um, it, it was too easy to disguise. And people weren't looking for it because it's not, I don't fit that um, stereotype. Mm. Uh, so I can't imagine what that would be like for somebody who does fit mm. the stereotype. But in, mm. in ways I found it very invalidating. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until I went to AA that I found people just accepted that I had a drinking problem because I mm. said I have a drinking mm. problem. Hi, I'm Yumi Steins, I'm an alcoholic. Mm. Do you think, sorry, I know you're meant to be asking a question. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that, um, once a journalist, always a journalist, um, do you think that it was hard for your loved ones to accept that you had an issue because I find this with, with when I stopped drinking, I was like the party girl. I was the last on the dance floor. When, when, and I was the drunkest person in the room. And when you take the drunkest person out in the room, out of the room, then, then someone else has to step up into that role. Yeah. Then it's, it's quite confronting. Yeah. Was it, was people, do you think that they, it, your drinking was a kind of, it was like a mirror to, the, to their drinking? And yeah, it, and I did feel a bit like you, like kind of like the, woo, let's yeah, go, people, yeah. and people would follow. Yeah. And it was fun to be that person, yeah. and I think it's fun for my friends to have that person yeah. in their lives. I remember when I was uh, a very little girl, my mum had this friend, I can't remember her real name, but I'll call her um, Tracy just for argument's sake, who was little like me and dressed outlandish like me. And at every party, I would always clock this woman because she would get embarrassingly drunk. Mm -hmm. And even a little tiny me could, could pick it. Anyway, they're still friends. They still live in the same town. And this Tracy woman comes to meet my lunch, my mum for lunch and she gets so drunk that my mum drops her home and she like unlocks her front door and falls into mm -hmm. the front of her house. And she's like 78 or something. <sighs> so sad. So mm. that was sort of like, it was, it was, it's grim that you could be mm. that person. But also normalised. And people so just, normal and yeah. enabled by people yeah. like my mum. She's fun. She, that's what she does. Only, <laughs> uh, only Tracy does. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Do you know one of the most common questions I get asked as the, the bottom one <laughs> is, oh, what happens when you give up, when you've gone from being you to sober? And I'm like, a lot of people can't cope. Mm. A lot of people drift away. Because in actual fact, you'll find that a lot of really heavy alcohol abusers, misusers, whatever you want to call it. People get hostile about labels, so whatevs. Call it what you want, but people who get pissed <laughs> congregate. Mm. They do. And so when I got sober, I had a lot of people just ever so slowly drift away. And, the quest, and what I then say to people is, yeah, prepare yourself for a little bit of a rude shock, but also prepare yourself that you, whoever you are, underneath all of that mess and chaos that alcohol masks, 
When you get sober, you are forced into learning who you are. It's such a beautiful thing. Sobriety is not boring. It is the best thing I have ever done in my life to the point where I'm actually grateful that I was a raging alcoholic because I don't think I would have quit had I not hit the wall and nearly died. I don't. Mm. So anyway, you know, I just say to you, if you're out there contemplating, you know, sober curiosity, whatever, give it a crack. Give it three months. And if it scares you, and if you think you've got a problem, you probably do, just saying. Um, mm. But the beautiful thing is, when you emerge as the little butterfly that alcohol robbed of you, which was definitely my case, I just, it just stole me entirely. Um, now, the friends that, that I have, right? So yes, there was Drift Away and the people who were my biggest drinking buddies, we had nothing left. It was so sad. But now I meet amazing random humans and form lifelong connections based on actual legitimate, respectful friendships. And I cannot recommend it enough. Okay. Just encouraging anyone who that may resonate with. I was just going to disagree slightly with Shannon. Go for it, sister. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, it's been really lovely to meet Shannon. We've got a lot in common. But I do think that often when we have these discussions about sobriety, it's, it can have, sort of come across as like, and then I, I stopped drinking and everything was amazing. And that sounds like it was your experience. But for me, like, it's still a challenge. Like, for me, drinking was fun, you know? And I think... Well, that's and, why and, I say yeah, I'm coming from the you, bottom you're end from of the a different spectrum. Perspective. Well, I was, just, like, I was actually just going to ask whether or not for any of you there's been an element of grief in saying Definitely. goodbye to this thing that had, you know, it, was it like a, a very p powerful, motivating relationship in your life? It's, it's, it's kind of... Your friendships definitely change. I think I've got a big group of there's a group of eight of us who are all age and um, Herald Sun journalists who are very tight and we go on holiday together. We go out every weekend and my friendships with them have changed quite dramatically because when we go for their six hour boozy lunch, like there's only a window of about an hour and a half before it just makes no sense. And I'm just sitting there and everyone's talking <laughs> cardboard and, and it just, it's, it's like, oh, this is difficult. And so I'm the person that leaves that mm. lunch at 5 p.m. while they keep, they kick on and I go home and color code my bookshelves. <laughs> which, <laughs> oh yeah, no regrets about that. But yeah, you do, you do have that kind of sense of, oh, well, who am I without that? Like, I, I still think I'm fun, but just for me, like, inevitably, your social networks change, and I find that I have much more profoundly meaningful relationships on a smaller basis with smaller groups with one-on-ones. Yeah. So in that Heaps group of journey. eight, I, I, spend, I, I make more of an effort to see them individually than mm -hmm. I would as a group, because as a group, I don't find it as much fun as I used to. Yeah. It's mm. funny to arrive at this, at this point of sobriety, at this point in my life, because what I see is a lot of women who are working really hard and kicking goals and achieving things and maybe they've been able to go back to full-time work after having a kid or something. And what they want is to reward themselves. Mm. And it's by, you know, buying a ticket to see a talk at All About Women, All About Women Festival because you've got a little bit of disposable income. And with that, you can kind of, like, splash some fabulousness on yourself. <laughs> and I think that, like, allowing yourself to have that beautiful glass that gets a bit misty on the outside and mm -hmm. uh, the restaurant meal, it's very much like sitting in the pocket of a reward for me. Mm -hmm. I deserve it. And when people want to take that away or you want to take it away from yourself, you, you're very resistant to it because you've earned it and you've worked so hard to get to this point that you really have to dig around like a kid in a sandpit trying to find ways to reward yourself that aren't booze. And maybe it's food, which a lot of women do when they quit drinking, is they overeat. Mm. And so that's like an imperfect solution. So you're back in the sand pit digging around. And um, community is one of the things, being a smug bitch is another. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think a lot of us throw, throw ourselves into work. And then for, for me, it's been fitness. Mm -hmm. So trying to find a thing that I can do that's not about consumption. Mm. Well, so then that sort of speaks to the reality that for a lot of people, there's something that we're trying, there's a hole, mm. some kind of hole, a something shaped hole that needs to be filled. So whether or not, I mean, it's, it's true that, you know, and it's often said of um, addicts that they replace one addiction. I'm not saying that that's what you're doing with fitness, maybe totally you are, yeah. But, yeah, but, same. but they replace one addiction with another. And so yeah. it's not uncommon for mm. reformed drug addicts yeah. or alcohol addicts yeah. to become like born again Christians yeah. because it fills this 
need in their life. So if we're not, as a, as a collective society, if we're not looking at what this spiritual, uh, and I don't mean like theocratic, but spiritual emptiness is that we're trying to fill, maybe we, I can understand, I mean, there's been nights when I've gone home and I've got a small child as well, and nights when I've gone home and I've opened a bottle of wine mm. and, and there's something like deliciously attractive in the self-destruction of <laughs> thinking I'm going to nail this bottle of wine tonight and, I, and you mm. get to the second or third glass and you're like, I don't, I don't need this, but you know, I'm going to fucking what do it. it because, <laughs> have you, yeah. Clem, have you watched the TED talk called The Opposite of Addiction is Connection? I have oh, not, but I've really heard. good. Write it down. Yeah. Lovely ones. You've probably heard of it if you're sober curious. But it speaks deeply about how addiction and isolation and loneliness. Mm. Hello, she who couldn't have a child in a small country town, watching everyone get knocked up and give birth and mm. do what women are supposed to do. I just wanted to. Oh, it was just horrendous. Well, it's interesting you but say that. It was that. lonely. It was lonely. I, I don't think yeah. that my. Uh, That's just we're at the intervention stage of the. Day, obviously. No, I was just going to say, because Yumi, this is particularly a question for you, that um, I don't think that I, when I drink in that sort of like, you know, daring the devil kind of way, I don't think it's due to loneliness. I think that I justify it to myself because I think, well, I have a very, I've got a very tough job. Mm -hmm. And there's been a couple of incidents, I don't know at what, which point before or after you quit drinking that these happened, but there's been a couple of instance, instances in the last couple of years where you've been thrust into the public mm -hmm. I, in a way that has attracted like a huge amount of trolling and vitriol your way. Um, has that coincided with your sobriety or has that, has that, have those circumstances made you want to drink again? Have they fed into each other at all? Um, not in the recent ones. So as far as the trolling cycle goes, there's usually one every two years for me. So <laughs> I'm on to about my fourth cycle or fifth now, but the, the, first, mm. the first one was probably the worst and that was when Channel 10 got 36,000 complaint phone calls about me in one afternoon. And there weren't even 36,000 people that watched the show because <laughs> it didn't rate very well. Um, so that, that um, was a situation where it was very, I, I hadn't experienced it before. Mm. So I didn't really kind of know what the pattern looked like. And to be honest, it was sort of fresh in the cycle of trolling um, in the world, in, in media. And um, I think, that in retrospect, I wouldn't have admitted it then, but I think now I can look back and say, I think I definitely drank my mm. feelings to mm. suppress my feelings mm -hmm. about it then. And I had so much confusion. Mm. And I think that, but I think mm. the, the world makes us feel like that. Mm. Like I think we get gaslit on many levels just as women and we're so confused and we're like, am I fucking crazy? Like, mm. is this? Is this actually mm. me imagining things or is it actually still quite an unfair society? Mm. Pass me a drink. Mm. I think it's like it, it can be any trigger. Anything that we can use to justify it to ourselves. We've got about seven minutes left to take questions from the audience. Um, please, if you do, uh, the microphone is just here and here. If you do come up to ask a question, please remember to keep it succinct and brief so that we can get through as many as possible because they do take us out the back and whip us if we go over time. <laughs> uh, so do we have any questions? <laughs> There's one coming up here. If you just like, if you put your hand up, if you just like to go and line up at the microphones. So we'll just take one at number one. Um, hi, my question's for Yumi. Your story really resonated with me. Um, and how did you actually give up? Because you said that you kind of drew the line in the sand and yep. said that you would, and then you drank a beer or several that day. So what was it in the end that made you stop? So I did a fair bit of Googling and I had understood that I would probably crave drinks for a good 10 days. Like the physical cravings you actually pass over fairly quickly. So I just had to get through the 10 days and I, I didn't really explain but at that party I drank a shitload and it was a party where there were like all these industry people that I really wanted to impress and I was unemployed at the time. So I was like, this is a room where you need to actually be working it and talking to people and letting them know that you don't have a job. But I didn't, I just sat in the corner and quietly sank heaps of cans. And I was so ashamed of myself the next day that I was, I, I was actually mortified. I sent out apologies to people. But I also knew that I could use that shame and ride like the wave of shame to get me through those first really tough few days. 
because it was enough to make me never want to be that person ever again. Mm. And, and the, the following days after that would be hard because I'd be sh like shaking and feeling mm. crook and wanting to drink, but I would have to just like search for like an inspiration, you know, which is what they talk about at AA, like a higher power, but it was basically like just to somehow get through it. Chewing gum is actually something that I chewed shitloads of chewing gum. And I also got non-alcoholic beer, which was super helpful. Like some people, we talked about this off, yeah. off stage, but some mm. people find it really bad, but I found it mm. fizzy water with a piece of lime just to feel like yeah. um, I'm not in a state of desperate deprivation, yeah. that I'm allowed to have something. Mm. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing so candidly. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kate. I almost said I was a something, um, but I'm not in that meeting. Um, <laughs> so I've been clean and sober for nearly 43 years. And it's really interesting uh, because it's almost like, you know, AA is in films now and it's a fashion statement. And you know, like, we can talk a bit about it now because it's not kind of behind closed doors. But my, my question is, um, Especially in terms of 12-step programs, of which there are a zillion, doesn't matter what your addiction is, there's a 12-step program, um, is... Uh, I've lost my train of thought because I'm having a serious moment. 12-step um, programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to recapture your train of thought yes, and we'll I go to this question? Oh, shame. Hi, um, my name is Trish and I have a question for Jill. Um, so I really resonated when you said that drinking is something you kind of grieved over a bit and it was something that used to be really fun for you or maybe you still think about how fun it, it was. Um, I quit drinking officially six months ago and I have a lot of people that come to me still and say like, you know, drinking is something I love to give up, but it is something that is so fun and I really love it. And I think for me, like I lost the fun in it because it was making me feel so shitty and it, I kind of find it hard to give people advice when they're like, what do I do? Like, I love drinking, but I want to give it up. So I guess I wanted to see if you had any advice for people like that who just no. still really love it. <laughs> oh, well, um, I, I, do, I do think, like Yumi, I love a non-alcoholic beer, and that wasn't around and when I wrote my first book. That just wasn't an option. And I think there's something in, in the kind of ritual and ceremony of having a drink that feels like a drink. And, and I think more bars that do that make it feel you don't feel that, that sense of belonging that we were talking about is, is there. Um, I, I think it's just in, when you strip back why you use alcohol and realizing, you, as, as Shana says, you really find out who you are underneath it. And that to me is where the joy is. That's where, mm -hmm. when people say, oh, well, I won't be able to have fun anymore. For me, if I think about where fun used to take me, mm -hmm. it, laterally I was blacking out, couldn't mm -hmm. remember things and yep. waking up and going, oh, I've just, like text message or called my best friend and called him a dickhead in the middle of the night. Like, you know, there was, I knew where I was going. Well, I was blowing up the friendship. So I feel like, think about where alcohol will take you. And if I don't, I think that, that kind of fun night out, it's usually after the first couple of drinks, it's then it's the third and the fourth and the fifth that start to mm. become less fun. And if, you, if you're not good at, good at stopping at the third or fourth drink, like I'm not, then, then maybe, you don't need to have alcohol in your life. But yeah, I don't really have an easy answer for you other than, yeah, think about your friendships. They do change. And mm -hmm. maybe, like, I, ha I honestly think that my friendships have been deepened as a result of me being sober because I do say the things that I want to say to people and I, I catch up with them separately and in smaller groups. So I, it, I think they just have to accept that life will change and, not, and kind of railing against it is, is kind of the problem. Like, so grieving for the part of you that you've lost but accepting that things can change and they can be better. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I remembered. You've got, you've got your <laughs> so I'm question back? I'm 69 on Wednesday, so that's my excuse. <laughs> um, no, so it's this, like, and I'm British, so, um, but I'm Australian as well. But do you think, that this is to all of you, that there's something in, in Australia that, um, I guess it's called denial, but this whole thing about a misconception or a misunderstanding of what addiction and alcoholism is. So you can sort of say, oh, well, that's that person over there. You're mm -hmm. shit-faced. You're shit. You know, you've got a problem, mm -hmm. but but I'm okay. And that we need to break down. Totally agree. And have an, an understanding of what addiction yeah. really is and what you know, being sober and living sober really means without the wowsers. Yeah. I can I grab that because I think that's a great question because most Australians think you have to be drinking in the morning out of a scotch 
bottle with a brown paper bag or all day or during the day or every day, total load of crap. Alcoholism looks like many, many things. Addiction looks like many, many things. It's not a cut and dried response. There are so many angles to that. I didn't know I was a raging alcoholic when I probably had been for years and years and years. So I agree, I think that Australia is kind of an alcoholic, <laughs> awkward, but we really literally promote alcohol that much in our society that the level of drinking we do is casual alcoholism, is what I call it. But because we've got nice jobs and nice haircuts and whatnot, it's disregarded because we're not them. We're not those people. So I do believe our, our conversations in that space have got to urgently change and we need to give people some guidelines as to what it is or what it isn't. It, but like I said, there's loads of shades of grey, but honest and real conversations are lacking. But thanks to amazing girls like this who are being really, really profoundly honest, that's changing and that's the lovely thing about not being secretive about it, mm. you know? We're changing that conversation. Thank you. Uh, we've run out of time now, but I just wanted to finish on a note, uh, something you just said, Shanna, about people being able to differentiate between us and them, those mm. people. And I think that what would really help all of us, and not just in Australia, but across the world, mm. particularly when dealing with issues of addiction, is not doing that, us, yeah. and, us and them, and having, you know, really coming to any kind of um, state of wanting to change with compassion and a model of compassion and yeah. a model of empathy and acceptance uh, so that people aren't trapped in those shame spirals and aren't mm. trapped in that sense of not wanting to come forward and seek help because of the judgment that exists. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming to this panel at All About Women. Could you please give a big round of applause to our panellists, Jill Stark, Shanna Wan and Yumi Stein. You can follow along at the hashtag at hashtag All About Women. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Do check out the Pay the Rent website. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Clem. Thank you, thank thank you, you Clem. And Sam.